What's up guys, welcome to the third video of the course Dynamic Programming for Beginners. A quick note before we get started. One of our students whose name is Bogdan suggested that we set a schedule for all of the new videos of the course, which is a great idea, considering that I have a full-time job and cannot devote 100% of my time to the course, I think Sunday could be a perfect day to release new episodes. This way, I have a chance to prepare the material during the work week, then record a video on Saturday and release it on Sunday. So that's the plan and I hope it will work out well for all of us. Bogdan, thank you so much for an amazing idea, it's great. Cool, now let's talk about the plan for today. Today we are going to do two things. First, we will learn how to spot dynamic programming problems and second, we will go over the very basic problem and then implement it in Go. So, in the previous lecture, we gave an abstract definition to what dynamic programming is, right? We said that dynamic programming is a technique that helps to solve uh, a class of problems that have overlapping subproblems property and optimal substructure property. Optimal substructure means we can get optimal solution to the problem by combining optimal solutions of its subproblems. And then, if we solve the same subproblems multiple times, it means overlapping subproblems property is also present in the main problem. Okay, so hopefully you understand the abstract idea of dynamic programming. We've talked about the pros of using it from a time complexity reduction perspective, we've talked about properties, but now I want to talk about how to recognize these problems in the wild. How do we find these types of problems and know right off the bat, like, hey, this would be a really, really good candidate for the dynamic programming technique. For the most part, these problems can be divided into two categories, combinatoric problems and optimization problems. Let's write it down. So let's say dynamic programming, we have a dynamic programming black box over here and this black box receives two types of problems as an input. Combinatoric type, uh, combinatoric problems, combinatoric problems or optimization problems. Optimization problems. And as an output, we get a solution. Combinatorial type of problems ends with the question, how many? Let's write it down as well. So combinatorial problems ends with the question, how many? Here are a few examples of combinatorial problems. How many ways to make a change? How many ways to traverse a graph? How many steps needed to get from point A to point B? In this type of problems, your end goal is to count something. Now, what about optimization problems? In optimization problems, we are interested in finding a strategy which maximizes or minimizes some function. One of the combinatorial examples that we just mentioned was how many steps needed to get from point A to point B. In this example, we are interested in the exact number of steps. But if this was an optimization problem, it could sound something like what is the minimum number of steps needed to get to a certain destination? Because it's possible that there are many ways to get to point B. As you can see, we are not simply interested in the number of steps, but the minimum number of steps. Okay, here are a few more examples of optimization type of problems. What is the maximum profit gained by buying and selling a stock? What is the minimum cost to travel from New York to Mumbai? So in the optimization type of problems, your end goal is to minimize or maximize some function. As soon as you see the problem description asks you to find the maximum or minimum of something, this is a hint screaming, hey, what if you try dynamic programming here? Okay, so knowing all of that, let's give a more complete definition to what dynamic programming is. Dynamic programming is an algorithmic technique to solve combinatorial and optimization problems, utilizing the fact that the optimal solution to the overall problem 
depends upon the optimal solution to its overlapping sub-problems. Great! Enough theory, we want practice. We are ready to start looking into the first basic example. Let's say we have a problem in which we need to calculate, in which we need to find the sum of the first n numbers. So we have something like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus dot 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 plus n. And this is a sum for all the i's starting from 1 to n, right? And by the way, for those of you who don't know what the sigma sign is, it's called the summation symbol and it's an equivalent of a for loop in math. So in this case, we want to run a for loop for all the numbers starting from 1 to n and then add them together. Okay, so we have this complex problem that we want to solve with dynamic programming. So what is the complexity of this problem, right? To get the sum, we need to add a lot of numbers together. Say n equals to 1 million. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on until n is 1 million. And by the way, this is a sample problem just to let you feel dynamic programming. In reality, we can easily solve this problem with arithmetic progression. But let's assume that we don't know what arithmetic progression is, just for the sake of example, right? So we don't know how to calculate the sum all at once. Let's try to apply dynamic programming namely by breaking down the problem into many sub-problems. So let's solve the simplest possible problem first. What is the simplest possible sum we can calculate? Let's assume that n equals to 1. So in this case, the, po the smallest possible sum is just 1, right? So what is the sum of 1? It's just 1. So let's define the sum of the first element as f of 1. And we know the answer, it's easy to calculate because we don't even have to calculate anything in here, right? So the sum of just one element is the element itself, right? Great. Now we can do the same with two elements. So let's say n equals to 2. So we can define uh, the sum of two elements as f of 2. Now, here is an interesting thing. Here is the core idea of dynamic programming. How to calculate the sum of two elements knowing the sum of just one element? It's very easy, right? It's very simple. We just need to add we just need to take the sum of one element, this guy, and add the second element to it, right? So we take f of one, and we add the second element to it. So plus two. This equals to, we already know that f of one is one, so it's one plus two. This equals to 3. Now check it out. We've made a very simple operation here. We had one number, f1, store it somewhere and we simply added another number to it. We added 2, right? Great. Now let's see how can we calculate the sum for three elements, right? For the first three elements, n equals to 3. It's exactly the same process. We define f of 3 and as we've just said, to calculate the sum of three elements, we need to take the sum of the previous two elements and add the third element to it, right? So we take uh, the sum of the first two elements, it's f of 2, and we add the third element to it. f of 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 3 and this equals to 6, right? Now we can keep doing the same operation again and again and at some point in time we will calculate 
f of n, right? And just by looking at just by looking at the first few solutions, we can devise general formula for this problem, which is f of n. And this equals to the sum of previous elements, which is f of n minus 1, plus the element itself, plus n. And this is the final formula for our problem. With this formula, we can solve the problem for any n, right? So we broke down into smaller sub-problems. We solved the very simplest problem, f of n, f of 1. Then, knowing the result of f1, we solved um, the problem for two elements. Knowing the result for two elements, we solved the problem for three elements. And doing so, we were able to devise general formula. So once again, this is a very simple problem, but it demonstrates the ideas of dynamic programming. What's different about other problems? Well, it's just the implementation details. The other problem may have a slightly more complicated formula. Maybe it's not just f of n minus 1, but something like f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 multiplied by 3, and so on. But the core idea of dynamic programming technique stays the same. Okay, so now we are going to implement all of that in Go. We'll take a look at the implementation and in the next lecture we will talk about, we will, we will solve a little bit more interesting problem, a little bit more real, uh, but it's still very simple, it's still going to be a very simple problem. Um, great, so take care and enjoy the rest of your day. What's up guys, we are ready to start implementing our function. So I've got a Go land here, which is part of IntelliJ. Um, I'm going to create a new folder, lecture three. And in this folder, I'm going to create a new file, lecture3.go. Uh, cancel. Awesome. So now the next thing that I would like to do here is to give a definition to the problem. Uh, basically describe what we are going to do. So the problem statement um, asks us to find the sum of the first n numbers. Then the next thing I would like to do is to describe our objective function. An objective function simply means the production output. And in this case, f of i is the sum uh, of the first i elements. And the last thing we want to write is our recurrence relation, which is the final function that we devised a few minutes ago. Uh, we set the sum of all the sum of n numbers equals to the sum of um, all the previous numbers plus the number itself. Great. Now let's define the function. We'll give it a name and sum. As an input, we get n. It's an integer, and we need to return a sum of all the numbers. So, which is an integer as well. Now the next thing I'm going to do is to define an array that will hold the result of our subproblems and this array will be of the size n plus 1 since array starts from, uh, from 0. Now if you look at our recurrence relation function you can see that we always calculate uh, the previous, the, that we always access the previous element, the previous sum. So let's say n equals to 0 in this case, our recurrence relation function will fail because we cannot access f of n minus 1, which would be f of negative 1 in this case. So in, at, at that point, we need to always start from 1, right? But if we want to start from 1, then it means that we need to know the answer to f of 0. So we're going to calculate it manually. So we're going to say that f of 0, dp of 0, equals to 0. And at that point, we are ready to start calculating our sum for the rest of the numbers. So we can say for all the i's from starting from 1 
two in. Apply our function. Once we finish this loop, the answer will be in the last element. So we can return dp of n. And this is pretty much it. This is the code for the entire problem. Um, now let's write some tests and make sure that the code works as expected. I'm going to use IntelliJ's generators and generate tests for this whole file. IntelliJ is smart enough to provide us the template. And now we just need to add test cases. So the very first thing that I would like to test is the edge case. Uh, so we'll say edge case one would be something like n equals to zero, right? And in this case, we want zero as an output. The other edge case could be something like one. So when n equals to one, the output would be one. And then we can also run a regular, like a simple test, simple test, which would give us the sum of when n equals to five. So the output would be 15, should be 15. Now let's test, let's run it. Great, as you can see, all the tests are green, so to speaking, um, meaning that our code works as expected. And now the last part that I would like to do here is to commit our code to GitHub uh, so that you guys have access to it. And let's do it right now. We will add all the files. We'll commit it with the message code for the lecture number three. And push it to master. Great. The link to the repository is going to be in the description. Uh, so you now have access to the code. Uh, please review it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye.